Sabine Hossenfelder, welcome to How the Light Gets In. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so, Kahn said this famous quote, the two things fill his mind with awe and admiration, the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him. Do you have a feeling of awe and admiration towards the universe? Sometimes, uh, sometimes more so, sometimes less so, uh, depending on what news page I look at. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's certainly a reason I went into science, because that's what inspires me. Um, so certainly that plays into my motivation to go on with my research. And is it, is it hard to revisit that sort of feeling of awe and kind of mystery many years down the road when you're, when you're a researcher and you're caught in the thick of it? It's kind of interesting how much my interests have changed over the time. Like when I started out doing physics like 20 years ago, I was very much into particle physics. You know, mm. I thought that's the most interesting thing ever. Like what's matter made of? What are the smallest things? And how does everything hold together? You know, how, how does the whole universe get built up of these tiny things? And I, I've drifted away from this towards more, you could say philosophical questions about how much can we actually really understand using mathematics about the origin of the universe, about also the structure of matter, but also uh, what do we mean by a measurement? Uh, you know, can we take the human out of the equation? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And in relation to that, I mean, you've, you've long argued against sort of looking for beauty in physics and how mathematics can somehow lead physics astray down sort of uh, rabbit holes. Um, even if there isn't a place for beauty in physics, is there still a place for creativity, you think? Is physics a creative endeavor? Yeah, you, you're phrasing this a little bit more strongly than I intended it to be. It's not that I say there's no place for beauty in physics. What I object to is that a, a lot of physicists, in particular theory development, use very constraining notions of beauty, and they just assume that nature has to fulfill them. And what the argument that I make in my book, Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, is that if you start with the assumption that nature has to be beautiful in a particular way for which you have a mathematical expression and, and you use this as, a, as an assumption for your theory development, um, that's the wrong way to go about it. Uh, instead, we should be looking at nature with an open mind. And I think that's how we will find new beauty. So it's not like there's no beauty, uh, but I, I don't like it that physicists use beauty in this very narrow uh, sense. Uh, so you're asking, is there a place for creativity in science? Well, it, it's pretty much impossible to do science without creativity. Um, but it's, it's kind of a very constrained type of creativity uh, compared to the arts, where you have a lot of freedom, whereas in science it's very technical to some extent. You know, there, there are lots of rules you have to obey, and you can't just say, well, I'll, I'll break them a little bit, <laughs> right? You're not allowed to do this. And in theoretical physics in particular, a lot of those rules are just mathematics. Um, you, 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 just, you can't just say, well, I'll, I'll forget about the mathematics and um, stop believing in it. So apart from sort of this, this notion of beauty, physics is also driven by other values and a kind of key one is simplicity, right? Theoretical physics for a very long time has been trying to get a unified theory of everything, having one simple sort of model that explains everything. Do you think that's also a sort of wrong motivation to be looking for simplicity and singularity in physics? Or is it actually helping drive physics innovation? So there are actually two different notions of simplicity, one of which is just, I would say, a natural ingredient of science, which is that you shouldn't make a theory more complicated than it has to be. Um, so if you have some kind of theory, it doesn't really matter what it is, um, you shouldn't add unnecessary assumptions. Um, and, and that's really, really important. I think to some extent, physicists themselves don't really understand how important this is, because if you don't have this assumption, uh, you, can, you can always do something like saying, and God made it. Right. And, and that would be a justified assumption. Uh, but the reason we throw it out is that you don't need it um, to actually make a prediction with a theory. Um, and so this is what you could call Occam's razor. Um, don't make any unnecessary assumptions. Um, but there's a different kind of simplicity that, uh, especially in the foundations of physics, scientists often refer to, which is what you just said. Um, we're looking for a theory that's just simple period. Uh, 
And um, that's certainly driven to some extent by looking at the history of physics, where we have seen a trend towards simplification. Um, you know, we had this uh, periodic table, you know, with all these different elements. Uh, and then we explained them by way of quantum mechanics. That dis explains all of these energy levels and the properties uh, of the elements. And then we discovered the atomic nucleus and uh, the uh, constituents of the nucleus and those constituents were themselves made of other things. And we ended up with this fairly simple theory, which is called the standard model of particle physics, where we have like 25 particles. That makes up the entire universe. I still find this stunning. Uh, so that's certainly simple, but it could be simpler. <laughs> and that's certainly driven a lot of research in physics. Um, and at this point, you have to ask, like, does it really have to be simpler? Like, does there have to be something simpler than this? And I think we just don't know. So I don't think it's a good assumption to start from, that the next better theory that we find necessarily has to be simpler. So going back to philosophy that you mentioned earlier, your, your interest drifting in that direction and thinking about where the human is a place in all this, concepts like measurement and the subjectivity that we bring with it, do you think science will be able to accommodate those uh, eventually, accommodate human subjectivity and the human kind of perspective on the world? Or is that always going to be something that's left for philosophers to discuss? Well, I would say it's more something for sociologists to discuss. Um, but it's, it's kind of, it's quite funny actually. I think that a lot of what counts as philosophy is actually more sociology of science. So those two are closer related than I think philosophers would like them to be. Um, so I, I've been very interested in figuring out how much we can possibly learn about the origin of the universe. And it's, when you speak to people who work on this, they seem to vastly overestimate how far we can go with the scientific method. And then we have in the, in the foundations of physics and quantum mechanics, we have this issue with the measurement problem. And there's been like a hundred years debate over whether or not we need to understand the role of the observer in it. And also it, may, it leads to the question like, what do we mean by an observer to begin with? Um, and I think these are super important questions that physicists kind of prefer to not acknowledge, which makes things easier, but it also means that you may be making a big mistake without even noticing. So do you think that philosophy can, philosophy of science and philosophers that think about these kind of the questions left un, uh, untackled by, by science, can that discussion influence how science develops or is philosophy always just sort of describing and kind of theorizing about what science already is doing? Do you think, do you think philosophy of science can have an impact on, on physics and how it develops? It can, whether it will, uh, I don't know. It's certainly the case that a lot of physicists are kind of not very friendly with philosophers. They tend to find pretty much everything that comes out of philosophy useless. Um, I don't share this opinion, but it's certainly something that I observe among my colleagues. And I have to say, to some extent, it's justified because a lot of what comes out of philosophy actually isn't particularly useful. And a lot of it is just looking at what scientists do and then trying to make sense of it. Uh, and I think they, that philosophers should be a little bit more proactive, you know, they, they should actually go and say, this isn't okay, and this won't lead anywhere, and we, we've made this mistake before, and you should have learned from it, but you shouldn't, but you didn't. Um, so I think there's a bigger role for philosophers to be played in the foundations of physics. Yeah, I think what you're saying is particularly true when it comes to something like the philosophy of time. I, I, I can see many philosophers who just sort of take the findings of theoretical physics about time and then try and figure out what they mean rather than kind of challenge them and very much, very quickly are happy to concede that time is an illusion or it doesn't really exist or things like that. Is that the sort of thing that you have in mind for philosophers to kind of challenge some of the results that are coming out of physics? So that happened to be a topic that I'm not personally very familiar with. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's part of the reason is, of course, that a lot of the philosophers don't really have the necessary background to actually question what comes out of physics. So they kind of take what comes out of physics and then they're trying to make sense of it. Uh, and 
it's, it's, a, it's a similar thing when you look at particle physics, like what I wrote about in my book, like this, this notion of naturalness. Um, it's not that they're so much critically examining it, as that they're more taking what comes out of physics and then that, they're trying uh, to make sense of it. Um, but I also know a lot of physicists who went into philosophy or a lot of philosophers who have some kind of degree in physics and they do really great work. Like, um, for example, I think in cosmology, uh, this is becoming really, really important, where we have um, David Merritt, he recently, so he's a, an astrophysicist turned philosopher and he's re recently written a book with the somewhat off-putting title, A Philosophical Approach to Mond. Um, but it's a really thorough analysis of uh, dark, the dark matter hypothesis versus modified uh, Newtonian dynamics, and he's asking like which of those two theories actually does better explaining uh, evidence, and he rates <laughs> these theories on a scale um, on criteria that have been provided by uh, philosophers. And, and I think that's super useful. Now we only have to get the astrophysicists to actually read it. And how has philosophy influenced your work as a physicist? Has it made you ask different kinds of questions than you would have had otherwise? Does it impact the kind of research that you think you're interested in doing? How does it, what's the impact of having studied and read and thought about philosophy in your work as a physicist? Yeah, it certainly influenced me. I think most prominently with the realization that you have to be very, very careful about how you define your terms. Um, and you have to be very careful about stating which assumptions you make. But also, so as I, as I already said, I've been drifting uh, more towards philosophy because that's kind of where all the questions end hmm. in the end. Uh, and so it's naturally gotten me interested in how much can we possibly know. Um, where does our knowledge end? Which is something that philosophers have written about uh, for a long time. And uh, are there some recent big shifts in cosmology that you're excited about? Is science, uh, the science of physics kind of moving forward or has it, is it, is, are we going through a kind of more stagnant period? How do you see the moment that we're in? Well, cosmology is, is an interesting topic to mention because I actually do see that there are some things being shaken up, you know, where people were once very, very sure they have it all figured out and now they have a lot of new data where they're like, yeah, it doesn't really fit in, you know, maybe we'll have to think about this again. Uh, and one of those cases is, for example, the cosmological principle, which roughly speaking says that the universe should be on, on the average, the same everywhere. Like if you average over very large distance scale, the distribution of matter should roughly be the same. And it, it just turns out from observations, it's not the case. And that's a problem because that's one of the assumptions that underlies the current standard model of cosmology, which is also called the concordance model or lambda CDM, so it's all the same thing. And that's very interesting because if you don't have um, the cosmological principle, you basically have to redo all these data fits. And that can shake up a lot of things and it could resolve some tensions and maybe lead to some new discoveries. You're a big science communicator. You have your own very successful YouTube channel. Um, you didn't start that way. You started out as a blogger, a science blogger. What's the difference between the written word and the visual kind of representation that you found? And, and, and you know, which of the two do you, do you think is a better medium for communicating science ideas to the public? Oh, well, I, I think they're, they're both good, but some work better for some people, uh, some work better for other people. It just seems to be the case, naturally, I would say that a lot of people find it easier to follow explanations if there's actually a person speaking like a real human being uh, and they have some um, audio signal, uh, basically. Um, also, I mean, a nice thing about doing videos is that you can add uh, animations and graphics. That's just much, much easier than if you only have the written word and you have to find these clumsy explanations uh, for things with uh, metaphors that never quite work. Um, so there's definitely a benefit to switching over to uh, something visual. It also has a disadvantage because there are many more things that you have to pay attention to, basically. You know, if you just write, you write and then you're done with it. Whereas if you make a video, not only do you have to think about the, the scientific content, 
you also have to think about how do I get it, get it across? Um, how do I speak clearly? Um, how are all these English words pronounced? <laughs> so it, it just brings up a whole bunch of new problems. And what are you currently working on? What's a project that you're currently passionate about? Uh, Research-wise, I'm working on modified gravity dark matter, uh, which I've been working on for some while. So we have some papers in the pipe that will hopefully come out by the end of the year. I'm also working on the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Um, so this is where my philosophical interests uh, have taken me. Um, it's something I kind of do on the side. And I just finished writing a book. Uh, so I'll have a new book coming out uh, next year in the summer. Uh, which is basically, it's about the intersection between philosophy and the foundations of physics. So all the big questions also about the nature of time, is time an illusion? Um, does the past still exist? Does the universe think? Um, all these kind of things are in my new book. What, is, what do you think is the biggest kind of question that arises from physics that is, has a kind of big philosophical question behind it? Well, it depends on, you know, do you mean the, quest the biggest question for me or the biggest question for the average person you would meet on the uh, street? I think what most people care about very, very deeply is uh, free will. Has physics ruled out free will? And my book has a chapter on that. Mm -hmm. um, so personally, I'm much more fascinated by this question, like, does the future already exist? Mm. Which seems to be strongly suggested, at least, by Einstein's theories of space and time belonging together. Mm. And what do you think that means? Do you think we can actually change the way we sort of live our day-to-day -day lives if we come to that realization that time is an illusion, time is the future is fixed, it's all laid out like a map and we're just navigating it in some ways? Or is this all always going to be just an intellectual exercise for us? It depends very strongly on what you mean by change. Um, so arguably, as we live our life, we have to make decisions. And you could say those decisions make a change uh, in your life, for example. So that's one notion of change you can talk about. And that's perfectly compatible with the deterministic time evolution. Now, if you're asking, had there actually been different possible futures? And did I get to choose one of them? That just isn't compatible with the laws of nature that we uh, currently have. OK. Sabine Hosenfelder, thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.